Welcome back, everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at the 12th round of the FIDE Canada's Chess Tournament being held here in Toronto. Now, I've won a couple of games in a row. I'm a half point out of the lead, and today I'm playing as Ali Reza Perugia, the wonderkind from Iran, who now represents France. So without further ado, let's jump right into the action. So I start by playing E4. Ali Reza plays E6, I go D4, and now he plays D5. Now, this, of course, is Ali Reza paying ode to his adopted country as he plays the French defense. Now, in a weird sense of fate or irony, this opening was also played on one of the other boards featuring Pragnanta and Nepo. Now, I decide to trade the pawns on D5. We play the classic exchange variation, and now I go Knight F3. Now, shockingly, this exact same variation was also played in the game between Nepo and, Nepo and Prag. But in that game, Prag decided, I believe, to play this move. Um, I believe Knight C6 was played, and then the game continued with Knight C3. Whereas in my game, Ali Reza plays this move, Bishop to D6. Also worth pointing out that after Knight to F6, this is the position I had in my game against Nijat Abasov early in the, earlier in the tournament. So... Ali Reza goes bishop d6, I play c4, and now we get knight f6, and here I go c5. Now, this is actually very similar to what could what, what happened in my game between or between myself and Abasov, where we had the same kind of structure where Abasov pushed a pawn to c4, and I got this bishop on the nice long diagonal with the pawn chain. Now, as we get back to the game here after c4, knight f6 is played, I play c5 here, so this way black cannot get that same diagonal where the bishop is on c7, spying the pawn on h2. So I go c5, bishop e7 played by Ali Reza, and here I play this move queen a4. Now this is something I had looked at very, very briefly a couple of days ago for one of my other rounds. It simply was the move that was in the file. I don't really understand why it was in the file, but it was there, so I decided to play this move anyway. Also, I'd point out that the computers generally say any move is playable. So even though it looks weird putting my queen here, the computer, I think, wants black to put the bishop here so that black cannot go for something a little bit different. Let's say I go bishop d3, b6 castles down the road. You can have some position where black can put this bishop on this a6 diagonal. And so I think that's why the computer likes this move queen a4, because after bishop d7 and queen c2, bishop cannot get to that diagonal any longer. So Ali Reza decides the castle. I go bishop to e3. Knight c6 is played, and now I play knight c3, and here Ali Reza plays the move b6. Now, up to this point, this was all still, all still preparation from me. I still knew what was going on, but b6 is the first move that kind of took me out of book. So here I play the move bishop e2, and one of the great things about being able to get to move 11 very quickly in the game is that I don't have tough decisions. In this position, either I have to trade the pawns on b6 and reconnect black's pawn structure, after which black will be doing quite well here with the three pawns in the center, or I ignore it and I play like in the game with bishop to e2. Now, the reason that I played bishop to e2 is that I'm hoping that black will trade these pawns and down the road I can go rook to d1, pressuring this pawn on d5. It's also worth pointing out that in this position, black's b's on d7 and e7 are a little bit boxed in here. Black would love to also get some position like, um, let's say some position like this, where down the road he can put the bishop on d6, and now the two b's are very well placed. So, after bishop e2, Ali Reza plays this move knight b4, and it was very clear already in the game that Ali Reza was going for a very concrete idea, because he's moving all the knights and the b's all over the board here, and it's just something where black is not really doing a whole lot. So I go queen d2, he plays bishop f5, and now I go rook to c1. Important move, because if I play a move like a3, knight to c2 would fork the king and the rook. So I go rook to c1, Ali Reza plays knight g4, and he's trying to use d's knights and harass my bishops, and my king very, very early in the game. So here I play this move bishop f4 after a little bit of a thing, but once again, the great thing about this position is I don't really have a lot of options. If I don't play bishop f4 and I castle after takes, take, takes, takes, for example, black can go bishop to f6, followed by rook e8, and with these bishops on the diagonals, the open e file for the rook, and the knight going back to c6 to pressure the pawn on d4, I see no reason why white should be better here. So I play bishop to f4, sacrificing a pawn temporarily, but I'm hoping for a lot of activity. As we get the trade, bishop takes pawn, castles, and now you'll notice the rook on c1 is spying the bishop and the pawn on the file. The knight can easily be kicked back by h3 and a3, and just in general, it's a very, very tough position to play for black. Now, of course, computer thinks that black is okay here, but in human practice with so many pieces all over the board and being loose, it's just very difficult, and I already thought I was going to have good chances to win the game. So... Ali Reza plays the move rook to e8, and now I go a3, kicking the first knight back, but here he plays this move d4. Now, if Ali Reza were to go for a sack here, one of the lines the computer initially likes is to sack the knight, 
And then after takes to, to sack the rook here with rook takes bishop. After takes, knight d3, king g1, takes, and queen c1. I simply thought I was better here because I have a bishop and a knight for the rook. But I can blockade the pawns and the, blockade the d-pawn and the c7 pawn is very loose. And I thought I was simply much better. Although the computer, of course, says that black is completely fine. Instead, all it up being a 2800 human player plays the move d4, which is what I expected. And now I go knight to b5. Now, one thing to keep in mind, much like other games, is my time usage. Now, my time usage up to this point in the game, I was very happy with. Didn't think I was spending too much time. But around here, I start to lose the handle a little bit. Now, the first thing here was that I wasn't sure if knight b5 was the best move, or I could even play knight to a4 to try and go after this bishop on c5. Now, in retrospect, I probably should have played these moves a little bit quicker because they're simply the best moves in the position. But ultimately, I play this move knight b5. Anyway, Ali Reza goes d3. And this is where I spent a lot of time. I spent 22 minutes before playing my next move. And the reason I spent so long is I simply wasn't sure what the best option was. Initially, I did want to play this bishop d1 move. But after knight to a6, takes, takes, rook c5, and knight d5, I simply wasn't sure if I was better because black has this knight's path d pawn here. And after bishop b3 and knight f6, I thought black was okay. Now the computer gives white an advantage with bishop g5 because now there are all kinds of threats on the two diagonals with the b's, but over the board without knowing the evaluation, very, very hard to go for them. So I spent a lot of time trying to make this work and I wasn't sure what was going on. And then finally I went for the other line, which I had already calculated prior to playing a3, which was this move rook c5. Now one of the reasons I spent so long on this move is because after it takes and rook to e1, You'll notice that both the knight on b4 and the bishop on f5 are under attack here. But I was very concerned after knight d3, forking the rooks, rook takes f5 about this move queen to d7. Now, Ali Reza very quickly played this move, knight takes e1 after a minute and a half. And after this, I should have the advantage. But the reason I spent 20 plus minutes on this idea with um, rook takes c5 is because I simply was not sure what was happening after this move queen to d7 here. Now, computer wants knight bd4, takes, takes, and I guess after rook to e4, black is okay here. But it's very hard to play because without knowing that black is okay, you think white can go h3, something like knight to f6, and then a move like bishop to e3, followed by capturing the pawn on e2, and white probably will win the game. Again, easier said than done, as we're not computers and we don't spot all the best moves. Computer says after g6, I guess black is okay because everything is kind of hanging here. But again, not practical in a human game. But on the other hand, I was sort of relieved and confused because when I played rook f5 and Ali Reza immediately took, I was like, wait, why did I spend 20 minutes playing rook takes c5, calculate his queen d7 maneuver if he's going to go 91 right away? Now, after 91, 91 is played, Ali Reza was hoping here that after the queens come off and he plays rook d8, that with this pass e pawn here and the infiltration with rook d1, that he'll be able to have enough counterplay in return for white having the bishop and the knight for this rook on d8. Now, as it turns out, black does not have enough counterplay. So here I play bishop c3, Ali Reza goes rook d1, and now I play this move f3 here, trying to bring my king closer to it to go after this pawn on e2. Ali Reza plays knight to e3 here, which is probably a mistake according to the computer, but I think it's the best practical move. One other option is knight to, c, knight to e5 here, but after knight c7, rook to e7 here, I can simply go rook takes e5, takes, takes, rook e1, king f2. And after rook c1, king takes e2, apparently white's not cleanly winning because of rook c5, which is... Very hard to spot, but I assumed here with a bishop and the knight in return for the rook that I probably should be winning. So, Ali Reza instead plays knight to e3, and now I go knight takes c7, targeting the rook on e8 if he captures my rook on f5. Ali Reza goes rook e7, and now I play rook c5, rook no longer under attack, and the rook guards the horse on c7 from being captured. We get f6, and now I go bishop to b4. And this, I think, was really the critical move in the game when I play this bishop b4 move, because it's very easy to play a move like king f2, and suddenly after rook c1, black is threatening to play knight to d1, forking the king and the bishop, and it's getting very, very scary here. For example, if I play h4, check king g3, black takes the bishop, I'm not defending the knight any longer, and now black wins the game. So I spent quite a bit of time here, but ultimately I found this move bishop b4, which is very important because now there's no knight c2 move. But also if black was rook a1 and king f2 is played, knight to d1 is simply an empty check and I can move my king and the bishop is no longer hanging. So this bishop b4 move is very important because it dodges the forks on d1, but it also stops the knight from going to c2 with the rook on c5 as well. Now at this point, I thought it was very close to winning the game. And it's really, really important that when you get a position like this, that you don't rush. So Ali Reza plays king f7, I go h4, we get h5, and now I bring the king to f2 here, trying to put pressure on the pawn on e2. 
Now here, Ollie Rosa plays the move Rook B1. Now, oddly enough, I see the computer saying it's black and sack the Rook. And apparently after this, Knight B2, Rook C3, and Rook D7, black is somehow still in the game after Knight B5 and Knight D3. Amazingly, I don't think either of us even saw this idea, which is really kind of jarring because I thought I played a great game up to this point. But at any rate, we're not. Computers. So Ollie Rosa instead plays Rook B1, and now I go Knight to D5, and here he has to play the move Knight to D1. If Ollie Rosa were to trade the Knights on D5 here and take on B, actually not take on B2, say he goes Rook B7, after takes Rook B2 and Rook A5, White is simply winning here because the Bishop and the Knight are simply guarding each other, and eventually I'll be able to win this pawn on E2. One sample line is something like this, for example, where I go Rook D2, trade the Rooks, and then if he goes Rook E8, I have Bishop E3, and I capture the pawn at E2 and win the game. So, all I resin goes knight to d1 here, I go king g3, and now he plays the move rook e5, and here I play the move knight d3. Now, at this point, things are really going my way. All I is down to two and a half minutes for eight moves, and I'm already starting to think about winning the game. So, I play knight d3, he goes rook to e8, and now I play this horrible, horrible, horrible move bishop to e1 after a two and a half minute thing. Now, this move is simply a blunder here based on a miscalculation a couple of moves down the road. As you can tell, at this point, white is very close to winning if you go check. So after king g8 here, white can go knight e7, king h7, king h7, and now after this move, knight to f4, followed by knight to f5, you'll notice that d's knights are threatening to checkmate the black king very quickly. One sample line is takes, check, king h8, and knight to g6, and black's king has no squares available. But instead here, after rook e8, I spent two minutes, and I play this move bishop to e1, thinking that after knight takes b2 and rook to b5, I'm well on my way to a victory. Because now, both of the knights are going to come off the board, and with a bishop blockading the pawn, I figure it's over. Now, all I rest of goes rook d1, I take, he takes, I check, and the move that I missed here was this move king to f8. If black goes king g8, for example, after knight e7, let's say king f7, I can go knight c6, king g6, take the pawn, and after rook d1 and king to f2, white is simply winning the game. Now, why is it such a big deal, you might ask? The reason this is such a big deal is that here I cannot save this A pawn. So I was expecting to be in a position where I have the rook and the A pawn, but here not only can I not save the A pawn, black will also guard the pawn on A7, and I haven't won this pawn on E2 yet, so suddenly, even though white is still a little bit better, the game goes on. Now here I play the move knight f4, not knight to c3, by the way, because even though I can end up a pawn in this endgame, this rook and pawn endgame after rook e2 and rook to a2 should simply be a theoretical draw. So I go knight to f4, Ali Reza captures, and now the second problem is that I can't go bishop b4, checking the king and the rook, and attacking the rooks after the king moves, black is threatening to push p and get a queen on e1. So, regrettably, I have to go king f2, Ali Reza plays a5 here, stopping bishop b4, and now I play this move rook to a7. After rook to a7, Ali Reza plays move rook a4, and now I play this move g3, and we have reached the time control. Now, at this point, I was not feeling very good about the position, because there are a couple of things that are really important in endgames. The first thing to remember is that if we reach an endgame, let's just say, like this, for example, where I have a knight, bishop, and three pawns versus a rook and three, this should, technically speaking, be a draw. So this is the first thing that was in my mind, is I cannot allow this endgame. And I was very concerned that if Ali Reza played a move like rook a2, we could have this endgame. Because after knight takes h5 here, I thought the black could play rook to e5, guarding the pawn and targeting the horse. And if I take this one after rook to e7, takes, takes knight f5 and king f7, I'm really unsure if I'm winning black as the wide people is going down the board. And I actually think this probably should be a draw with correct play. So I was very worried because if he played rook a2 here, I did not see the concrete plan. One example would be rook takes pawn, rook takes rook, rook takes rook, bishop takes rook, and you're thinking, well, you're going to get the pawn on h5. Black can't guard it, so you're just going to win the endgame. So if I can get this endgame, for example, with the knight on e2 with three pawns versus two, this should be a technical win. But the big problem here is that if we get to this position after king f7, black is threatening to play g6 and guard the pawn. And if I capture here, there's rook to e5, and suddenly black is hitting both the knight and the bishop at the same time, and now I'm no longer winning the game. Now, fortunately here, Ali Reza very quickly played this move g5 after a five-minute think, and this is simply a move that I would say is unconscionable. I do not know what on earth Ali Reza was thinking when he played this move. I suspect that mentally, he simply thought he was completely lost, and it was a hasty move that he played. Again, as I said, if he played rook a2 or rook a1, the game goes on, and I'm really not sure if I would have won, but he did play g5 instead. So now we trade, I take the juicer on h5, and the reason that this position is now winning is because after rook e5 and g4 is played, I create this bastion with the knight on h5, but even my pawns here cannot be touched, 
and I can bring the knight back, put it on e4 or f5, multiple dashes or capture on e2. And technically speaking, black is just lost. So all he runs goes king e8, I play knight g7, he goes king f8, and now I go knight to f5, and here he plays the move rook a2, and now I check the king on f8. Now, at this point, the big issue for black is that he simply cannot do, he cannot save both the pawns here. It's really a big issue, also with the king being cut off here. And at this point, like I said, I could go through many lines, but objectively, it's already probably lost. So all I read to play is rook a2, I check king f7, and now I go knight to b6, he goes king e6, and now I go knight to c4, forking the rook and the pawn on a5. Now the reason I went for this is because what I'm aiming for here in my mind is a very technical position, where after rook b5, takes, takes, takes here. Now I have a bishop and a knight and two pawns versus a rook and two pawns, but most importantly, black cannot save this pawn on e2. So let's just say we got some sample line like this, for example, just to show you guys how white wins. I put the bishop here, and then I bring the knight to e4. And now with the knight guarded by the pawns, the bishop safe on d2, eventually I'll capture the pawn on g5 and win the game. Now, this is exactly why I thought the g5 move was so bad if we go back for a second, because the moment that I get this fixed structure with the pawns and the knight, I think that black is just lost. So I really don't know why Ali Rez allowed any of this to happen, but let's get back to the game. So we get rook b5, I take on a5, we get the swap. Ali Reza plays the move king d5, and now he plays the move king e3, and here Ali Reza resigns the game. Now the reason that Ali Reza resigned here, even if it appears a li little bit premature, is that after rook b2, I can play bishop d2 here, king guards the bishop, bishop guards the square, and it guards the knight most importantly, and black is simply going to have to yield eventually. Now what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that let's say black goes rook b1 and I take the pawn, and black goes rook b5. You'll notice that my knight is kind of dominated. It simply has no squares available to it at the moment as the king and the rook cover the critical squares. But the big issue is that I can simply play the move king d3, and now black is stuck. If black moves the rook to b1, I can take the pawn and then simply bring the bishop back to d2, and now I will simply start pushing p on the king side and win the game with the two pawns. If in this position, black tries to play, let's just say, um, we get, I can even get black the best version of this right here. I can now go knight c4 and a check, I block, and now eventually what I'm going to do is exactly what I did before, where eventually I reroute the knight, and then I bring the bishop back, and I simply capture the pawn on g5, and with the bishop and the knight combo and the two pawns marching up the board, it's a very easy technical win. So that's why after king to e3, Ali Reza resigned the game here, and I get a very, very big third win in a row. Now this game was looking very, very clean, a very nice victory for me for about the first 30 plus moves. I got really sloppy around time control, made a couple of very bad moves. Fortunately, the gods were smiling on me and Ali Reza made the last blunder when he played this move G5, which helped me win the game or my third game in a row. Now, obviously, as you guys can tell, I'm really quite tired. This game definitely had a lot of ebbs and flows to go from thinking I'm winning to being tied for the lead to suddenly thinking I might not win the game. Emotionally, it's very, very draining. So it's more emotionally that I'm drained than actually physically tired, but I am tired nonetheless. At any rate, I do get a third win in a row in this event. This does put me in a shared tie for first place. Now, Digu Kesh from India also won his game against Nijat Abasov from Azerbaijan to move into the shared lead with myself and Jan Nepomnesi. Of course, Nepomnesi drew his game against Pragnanata. Now, also, Fabiano Caruana won his game against Vidit Santos Gujarati. So he is also half point out of the lead as we head into the home stretch. It's very clear that one of the four of us will win the tournament. Now, who is it going to be? Nobody knows. Now, tomorrow will be a rest day, but in round 13, I will play with the black pieces against Jan Nepomnesi. And in round 14, I will have the white piece against the other current co-leader, Digo Kesh. So I do, in a sense, control my own destiny. It's worth pointing out that Fabiano also will be playing Nepo in the final round with the white pieces. So anything can happen. Uh, I would say there's a 50% chance of an American winning, which is always great news, of course. Hopefully it's me. But at any rate, it's going to be a really, really thrilling finish of the Canada's tournament. So on that note, I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to go get some dinner, relax. We have a rest day tomorrow before the final two rounds. So on that note, Hope you guys have enjoyed the recap. I do want to give a big shout out to all of you guys for all the support. It's very difficult. I'm not going to lie. Trying to like finish the games, do these recaps. I'm literally drawing on all the energy reserves that I, that I have at this point. It's worth pointing out as well that I am more than twice as old as some of the other competitors in this event, like Gukesh and Prague. So just giving it everything that I have. But I really do want to thank you guys for your support. I do appreciate it. And on that note, if you have not already subscribed to my channel, make sure that you smash that subscribe button below, and we will be back after tomorrow with a round 13 recap when I play against Yana Pomashi, the current runner-up for the World Championship. See you guys. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.